I don't want to just come to church ever anymore. I want to have the move of the Spirit of God every time I show up. Now, 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 now that, that, that can mean a whole lot of things to a whole lot of people and a whole lot of services. But sometimes, like we saw on Wednesday night, the move of the Spirit was just a strong teaching anointing come in the room. But whatever the move of the Spirit is, we ought to want that. Amen. If it's a run around meeting, let's all run around. If it's a roll on the floor and laugh meeting, let's all roll on the floor. If it's a worship meeting, let's all worship. If it's a prayer meeting, let's all pray. If it's a teaching meeting, let's, whatever it is, we ought to just all want that all the time. So that way, when we come to church, when, when, whenever we gather in any what way, it really is a school of the Spirit because we're allowing for the Spirit of God to lead and teach and guide us and, and walk us into whatever He wants to teach us that evening, that afternoon, that morning, that whenever, see. So Father, we're expecting utterance to come in the room tonight. We're expecting utterance to stir from the inside of us into the inside of us. Father, we're expecting for the Spirit of God to speak and move and teach and lead and guide us. Direction and provision and, 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 and redirection. Thank you, Father. Ah, mandele befredeso kora mandele befredeso kora mashabaya. Para mandele befredeso brofolusha non greke bafredeso non dele befredeso baya. Ah, para bafredeso kora mashikere beso non dele befredeso solanande. Past year or so, I, I, I walked into, further into uh, the call that God had on my life. And, and as I did and when I did, almost unknowingly it seemed like, almost unknowingly it seemed like because, because my attitude on, on many a day was just to show up and obey, you know. But, but when you do that, when you show up and obey, he, he has a way of leading and guiding you. But when I did, I saw more manifestation, instant one. I saw more man, physical manifestation, all kind of, I saw more of that in the people that was in the room with me than I had ever seen my whole life. I sense, I sense that healing presence in the room this evening. I sense that healing presence, if you're watching online, I sense that. I sense the tangibility of that presence. Do you know that the presence of God is tangible? The presence of God isn't just a goosebump on your goosebump. The presence of God isn't just when you get happy at church. And No, the presence of God is spiritual tangibility, something that can change your physicality. I don't say this out of tradition or habit. I just, I say this by, led by the Spirit of God. But, 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 but if, if, if you need hands laid on, on a prayer cloth or anything while I'm preaching even now, go on and bring the prayer cloth and put it down, down here and then you come get it, pick it up by the end of the service or better yet, pick it up by tomorrow. If you need a prayer cloth for anything, bring a cloth, bring a handkerchief, just go ahead, come on down now while I'm talking. While I'm talking, go ahead and just put it on out here. And whatever you bring down, you have to just make sure you pick your own one and, 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 and don't be. Do it, do it now. Do it now. Do it now while the Spirit of God is speaking about it. Don't come up to me afterwards and say, here's, I've got a prayer club. Do it now. Learn to obey God when He moves. Part of growing up in the things of God is when we learn how to obey Him and move with Him when He says move and then not say, no, I'll do that afterwards. I'll do that when it's convenient. I'll do that when no one's looking. I'll do that when I feel like it. I'll do that when... No, no, listen. Part of growing up spiritually is when you learn to obey God and move with Him when He says move. Which means we have to learn to respond to, which means we have to learn to move with, which means we have to learn to yield to whenever we feel a nudge. Well, what if I feel a nudge and I'm wrong? Well, if you feel a nudge and you're wrong while you're doing that, he'll see your heart to want to be right and judge you on that basis. Because God, your Father, isn't out to try and judge you. He's out to try and help you. And when he sees you want to do right, even when you do wrong, he'll cover that. This, this of having a prayer cloth and different things put up here. Five, six, seven years ago, the Lord started teaching me about this. Just to, just to teach me and show me that, that there is tangibility to the anointing and that it can work outside of, of, of being in the room that we're in, you see. 
And there was a season for a long time where I didn't lay hands on anybody. I just did this because the Lord was teaching me. Nothing wrong with the laying on of hands, uh, but he was just teaching me that, that there were ways outside of me laying on my hands that the anointing could move, see? If you all can leave this for tomorrow, that's good. If, if you cannot pick it up tonight, make sure you pick up whatever you left behind. Don't walk out with someone else's code. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and be seated a little bit while you can. You can still go on, you, you can still go on coming up to the front. I love that when we come together like that, uh, we can have the Spirit of God teach us and lead us and guide us. Listen, if I, I, I'm picking up tonight from where we left off on the Wednesday night service. So if you were not here, you want to go and listen to that real quick. I've listened to it five or six times myself because there were some things said under the anointing that I hadn't heard myself and I, I had to go back to the room and, and over Thanksgiving and all, I played it out and I thought, wow, that was really good. <laughs> you know, that just he, just, he said that real well, you know, and, and the Spirit of God helped us. And I like that. I've, I'm, I'm at a stage of my life where I listen to my own recordings now a lot. Because I, I, I come to find out that when you get under the anointing that way and when, you, and when you learn to yield to that anointing, you can say many a thing under the anointing that your head couldn't grasp a hold of, you know. So aren't you, aren't you thankful for recordings that you can go back and listen to because God's going to be saying stuff. And listen, e even, even beyond that, God's going to be speaking louder than my voice. God's going to be talking to you about things that, that you need help with that I wasn't even, we weren't even anywhere near that neighborhood in Scripture, but He can talk to you while you're sitting there and listening. That's how we ought to come expecting. You understand? So if you were not here on Wednesday, or if you were here on Wednesday, which would include everyone in the room then, <laughs> Go listen to Wednesday night service again. Turn in your Bibles with me real quickly to Romans chapter 8. That's where we started. Romans chapter 8. I've been here for a long time. Anyone who knows me knows that by the time I preach anything, I have been cooking in it myself for a long time. A long, long time. I like, I, you know, uh, 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 how I minister. And I do about seven to eight services a week, so that's, that's, that's a reasonable amount of services. You know, and how I, how I do that is that I spend the bulk of my time when I study, I study for me. I study for me because I figure that in any room I'm in, I need the most help at any one time and, and God needs to help me the most. But out of the overflow of my heart will come all this other. And because I preach out of the overflow, I never run dry. And that's, that's actually the truth. I mean, I, I, I don't do it. But if you knock on my hotel room door at three o'clock in the morning, and gave me like 45 minutes to fix my hair, I would probably be ready to come preach anytime real quick, you know. Because, because out of the overflow of your heart, do you, know, do you know that God intends for your heart to be full? Yes. And, and do you know that your heart isn't going to be full while you're trying to fix everyone else's issues? And so I, I kind of learned that real quick, and, and in, in some ways I get learned that, learned that the painful way, that, that the only heart I get to fill is my own. The only heart I can open up to, to God to fill is my own. But then the more I do that, the more there's an overflow out of my heart. When there's an overflow out of my heart, God can do all kind of wonderful things with the overflow that come from my heart. So, so Romans 8, you found it yet? You found it yet? All right, all right, Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Ooh, listen, if that's all we ever got tonight, that's good enough right there. There is no condemnation. This is as clear as you, there is no, uh, listen, you need, you, need like, you need like a theologian to come confuse you about this verse. This is as easy as it gets to understand. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. What's the definition of those who are in Christ Jesus? Who walk according, who, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, what is this and how is this and why is this? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What is this then? For the law, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. So the flesh and the law go together. So here's a new definition for what the law is. The law is anything you do in the flesh 
thinking it will strengthen you in your relationship with God. So therefore, anything you do in the natural that you think, if I do this, I'm going to score brownie points with God. That's become your law. That's going to become your weakness. Because whatever standard you set for yourself, I'll guarantee you, you'll break it. And then you'll judge you for breaking your law. Guys, I'm going to try that side of the room. They're going to show you how it's done. <laughs> so anytime you, you come up with something that says, I have to, and think that your have to is what's going to score you points with God, that's going to be, that's going to come back and bite you. Now, I'm not talking about not having discipline. Uh, th there are times when you've got to learn to discipline your flesh. You've got to make yourself do some things. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you making yourself do something, that's really for your benefit, not God's. If you, if you, if you need to sacrifice in order to discipline you, do that. But your sacrifice isn't going to make God more of God. He's already God. I needed the help. So therefore, because I needed the help, I got to train myself. But me training myself isn't going to make God more of God. He's, he already is. In other words, whether or not I worship God, He's God anyway. But me worshiping God is for my benefit because when I worship God, He suddenly becomes God to me and I recognize that. And when I recognize that, His God-likeness, everything about Him being God affects me. So when we start making up laws, and again, don't get caught up with what you think the laws is just the Old Testament. No, no, no. Listen, the law is anything you make up. Anything you make up that you think if I, if I do or if I do not, you've set yourself up for your own judgment. So there's therefore now, you know, have you noticed that most people who get condemned, get condemned for something they think that they should do but are not doing? And it's that way with everything. Now, obviously, no one who's ever preaching this is suggesting you can just go on out and do whatever you want with whomever you want, whenever you want. That's not what we're saying at all. That's not, that's not nowhere, anywhere near what we're saying. But the point is, you've got to understand that when we start deciding what our, our, our laws are, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to start judging other people for not following your laws. Without recognizing that they have their own set of laws that you're also not meeting. So you're standing here judging each other based on laws that you made up about each other. And the enemy has a field day with the church when that happens. Because then, then all, all we're going to be doing is judging each other and condemning each other and condemning ourselves for not keeping laws that we made up. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh... God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Notice that the way God dealt with this wasn't to give us a new set of rules. The way he dealt with this was that he sent the image of the son to be on the earth and the image of the son on the earth destroyed sin in the flesh. So it's the image that frees us, not the law that frees us. Ooh, did you hear that? It's the image of the Son that frees us. Now, 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 why is this important? Why is this important? Because picking up from what we were talking about, picking up what we were talking about on Wednesday, we said how really the purpose of our being, the purpose of everything that we do, and everyone, and, uh, everyone that's in here is really to just be in the image of the Son. Look at this now. Uh, let, let's go on reading this. Verse, um, verse 4 that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So notice this. When I walk according to the Spirit, I fulfill the laws of God. Now, you see, that's either good news or not so good news because, because for most people, when they think about walking in the Spirit, they, they imagine themselves in some sort of some sort, of, some sort of state where they may be running around the church or falling on the floor or, or, or have hands laid on them or, or they have goosebumps on their goosebumps thinking that the anointing comes. Listen, 
You're in the Spirit by virtue of what Christ has done for you. Ephesians tells us that you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You could not be more in the Spirit than being seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And I'll tell you this, there is no verse anywhere in any Bible that says you sometimes in the Spirit and you sometimes not in the Spirit. The truth of the matter is you're in the Spirit all the time because you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus all the time. So it really has to do with how you think and what you think. You know, sometimes you, 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 you hear people talk about and you hear people sing about how, oh, oh, all we need is the presence of Jesus, all we need the presence of Jesus, all we need the presence of Jesus, in the presence of Jesus, everything good and great and all that kind of thing. You hear them sing about that. But, but actually, scripturally, that's just not true. Just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The presence of Jesus was in many places where nothing happened. It isn't just the presence of Jesus that changes things. It's our awareness of the presence of Jesus that changes things. That's why it isn't enough to just be around something. You have to be able to recognize whatever you're around so you can participate with it because you do not participate of something you don't recognize. And if you don't participate, you do not partake of the benefits of whatever is around you. And it's that way with the anointing. If you don't recognize the anointing, if you don't learn to recognize and give in to and yield to the anointing, then you could be in a room where everyone else is getting healed and you're just standing there thinking, well, what's, what's, what's all the fuss about? But no, listen, God is in the business of raising up sons and daughters in this age who will recognize everything that the Spirit of God is trying to do. The sons of Ishakar are being raised up on the earth. And I don't want to. I, I I don't want to be. I don't want to be around the things of God. I want to be. I want to be a partaker of the things of God, and be involved in what God's doing, because that's where the benefits are. That's where the benefits are, see? That's where the benefits are. Listen now, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. Notice, notice, notice that the emphasis on what produces death isn't carnal living, but carnal living is a result of carnal mindedness. So when we set our minds on carnal things, and we're going to define what carnal things are because the moment people hear carnal things, they immediately think of sin. Oh, that's that drinking and cussing and swearing and running around and all that other. Listen now. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. What is the law of God? It's the law of the Spirit. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Listen now, he's going to define this for us. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Can I tell you that if the spirit of God did not dwell in you, you aren't a believer. So therefore, by definition of you being a believer, the spirit of God dwells in you. By definition of the spirit of God dwelling in you, you please God and are not part of the carnal mind. You have access to everything that the Spirit of God wants to do on the inside of you because He's on the inside of you. You know, I love talking about the Holy Spirit and I love talking about, about the flow of the Spirit and I love talking about the anointing and all those different things. And, and in a way, whenever people have me come in, whether it's services or TV or what have you, whenever, whenever all those things happen, whenever all those things happen, people usually want me to talk about those things. But you know, the flow of the Spirit requires our cooperation. See, and so if we don't teach, and you, you know, you got to have services where sometimes, I'll tell you what, we got to have services sometimes where we just come together and teach, but we also have to have services where we come together and just allow the Spirit of God to teach us by demonstration. It's necessary. Because there are some demons you couldn't teach out of people, you got to cast them out. There are some demonstrations of the Spirit you couldn't teach yourself into. You had to jump in so you can participate and learn how to flow with that. Now, teaching's important, and teaching has its place, but teaching isn't everything. And again, I'm convinced some people have, have mistaken what the Trinity is. They think it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Scriptures. It isn't God the Holy Scriptures, it's God the Holy Spirit. 
The Spirit of God illuminates the Scriptures to us. If we take the Spirit of God out of our services, if we take the Spirit of God out of our floor and out of our study in God's Word, it'll go dry on us real quick. And I say we have to have the Spirit of God come back to church again. We have to have the Spirit of God come back to our lives again. Without the Spirit, it's death. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone, listen now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. In other words, he isn't a believer. Well, guess what? Every believer then has the Spirit of Christ on the inside of them. So therefore, because every believer has the Spirit of Christ on the inside of them, it tells us here that we are indeed in the Spirit, not in the flesh. You see, your mind couldn't handle the fact. Your mind fights you in the fact that you're in the Spirit right now. Because your mind says, you know what? I know all that's happening. I know that's all, all that's around me. I know what I was thinking. I know what I wanted to say to that person but didn't over Thanksgiving dinner. I know what I wanted to do. I, I, know, I know all of that. How could I possibly be in the Spirit? Because your mind isn't in the Spirit. You, the real you, are in the Spirit. So your mind, you can, and that's, that's the other reason. You can be praying, praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit. And not all praying in, not all praying in tongues, praying, praying in the Spirit, simply pray, praying from the position of the Spirit. You, you, you understand? And so you can be praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit, and your mind goes to lunch. You ever had that happen? You know, you're praying and you think you're going somewhere, and then suddenly you're thinking about every other thing you think you shouldn't be thinking about while you're praying. Well, that's because when you pray that way, that's your spirit praying, and your spirit isn't your, your mind. And, in all, and aren't you glad when we pray in tongues, when we pray in the Spirit, our mind's not the one praying? Boy, we would be, we would be so in trouble if, if, if we were dependent on our mind to do all of our praying for us. I'll tell you what, I would be in trouble so bad if, if, all I, if the only way I learned to pray was whatever's in my head. My head doesn't know enough. That's why Ephesians 3.20 tells us that above all we can ask all things. He's able to do for us. Above all we can ask or think. That's my mind asking or thinking. But outside of that, above and beyond that, my heart, my spirit, able to connect with God and do so much more than anything my head could ask or think. Listen now, verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, which he established in the, in, in, in the verses further up that he, did, he, that he is, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. So in other words, what he's saying is that what's on the inside will affect your outside. The more you concentrate, ooh, listen, I send the spirit of God. The more you concentrate on the spirit inside, the more it will affect your body on the outside. So when I recognize the Spirit of God living on the inside of me, when I recognize that, that the Spirit of God, and because He's on the inside of me, I'm in the Spirit, the more I recognize that, the more I dwell on that, the more I give my mind to that, the more I give my attention to that, the more I stay there, the more it affects everything on the outside of me. Listen, the Lord's speaking to you. The Lord's helping you. This is an answer that you've been wondering about, how you change your outside situations by focusing on what's happened to you already on the inside. Ah. Uh. That's where, that's where the gifts and ministries and demonstrations, that's where the anointings are on the inside of you. That's where they are now. That's the answer to everything. <clears throat> Jump on down a little bit. Verse 14. Verse 14. I want to camp here for a little bit. Verse 14 tells us, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God... They are the mature sons of God. Something happens, and we started talking about this Wednesday. So again, if, 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 if you haven't yet, I, I want to encourage you to go get, that, go get that recording. Something happens when you understand that God, and I understand, you know, many times I'll go to, I'll, I'll go to places and they'll, they'll introduce me they'll say some great, nice, fancy thing about me, and they'll say something like he's a great servant of God or something, 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 you know. But the truth of the matter is, listen now, I'm not a servant. I'm a son. 
Now, in my service, I serve as a servant, but my relationship is not that of servant, it's of son. Can I, can, I, can, I tell you, can I tell you? Can I tell you? God already had servants in the Old Testament. What he didn't have was sons. And the revelation of the New Testament is not that we could be servants again to God, but the revelation of the New Testament is that we could be sons of God. That's why when the disciples went to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray the same way that John the Baptist teaches his people to pray, Jesus said, now, when you pray, pray our Father. Listen, he said our Father. He didn't say my Father, your Father. He said our Father. So that immediately means that, number one, we and Jesus are connected, and our connection is based on the Father. So in the same way that, ooh, listen, in the same way that God the Father is Father to Jesus Christ, He's also my Father. So in the same way that Jesus is the Son of God, I am a Son of God. Have to be, because He said, our Father. So no, I'm not a servant. I serve like a servant. You know what the difference is between a son and a servant? A son never fears going to the father about anything. You all that are parents, you know this. When those kids were small, if they wanted anything at four in the morning, they would come knock your door and make you get up or bed. A servant wouldn't do that, though. A servant wouldn't do that, though. They wouldn't dare do that. You see, the servant serves from a different position than the son serves from. And I, can I tell you this? Can I tell you this? God's raising up sons in this age. He's raising up mature sons. Why? Because God intends for us to inherit everything that He intends for us to have, and only sons qualify to inherit. Servants don't. So, so sons, sons here, ooh, keep, keep, keep your finger here in Romans. Skip on over for a little bit. Keep your finger in Romans here. To Galatians. Oh, this is good. Galatians 4. So here, here, here's, why, here's why I believe in believers growing up when they come to church. I believe in mature sonship. I'm, I'm glad when people get born again. I'm glad when people start, start coming to church. I'm, I'm glad when people are new. But I tell you what, uh, when we do, we ought to grow. Amen. God's goal isn't just that we come into the body of Christ, but God's goal is that we grow while we're in the body of Christ. Because God wants to give us things. Wants us to inherit things. You found uh, Galatians 4 yet? Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, listen now, as long as he's a child, does not differ at all from a slave. Can I tell you that in the body of Christ now, we got children of God who know different than slaves. You all didn't like that? It's true though. Why? Because they never matured to enough, grew enough to know that what their father has for them, they can possess. So as far as they're concerned, nothing happened. Now, I don't say this to judge. I don't say this to be mean. I say this to encourage. Listen, we, we ought to be a, a disciple-making people. And that means that I need to be discipled by someone and I need to be making disciples of someone. I don't want to be just a child that's as good as a slave, as good as a servant. I want to be one of these mature ones that, that can respond. You see, what's the, what's the difference? What's the difference between the, the son and, and, and the servant is that the son knows the father's heart. The servant has, only has to serve the father in whatever the father wants. But the son, because he's in the image of the father, because the son is in the image of the father, he knows what the father wants because he's in his image. And that would be me. That would be you. Made and called to be in the image of the Father. Made and called to represent the image of the Son on the earth realm. 
That's how Jesus could, could stand up in the midst of a storm and say, peace, because he was made in the image of God. He knew that in that situation, that's what the image of God would say. Can I tell you this? I don't know if you're ready to hear this. Can I tell you this? But Jesus wasn't just a believer. He was a knower. Did you know that there is a place beyond believing? It's called knowing. I want to get there. I want, do you hear me? You hear, now, I'll always be a believer in Jesus Christ, but, in, but in me being a believer in Jesus Christ, I will know some things about him that I won't have to believe anymore in that sense. Now, don't walk out of here with that sound bite and say, listen, he just said we don't have to believe anymore. That it just, that's, just, that's not what I said. I said that in my relationship, in my believing in him as the son of God, in my believing in him that he is the express will and purpose of God on the earth, I, will, I can get to a point where I know things. So, 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 so for example, John 10.10, 10, uh, um, we talk about the thief come to steal, kill, and destroy, and Jesus come down, I have life ahead more abundantly. That wasn't Jesus believing and confessing that to be true. He knew that. When he said, I'm the good shepherd, he wasn't believing he was a good shepherd. He knew he was a good shepherd. Ooh, listen. Can, I, can we raise the bar a little bit on our walk as believers? Can we raise the bar a little bit? Can we raise it? Can we raise it to where we're no longer just trying to believe, wanting to believe, and trying to step in? No, listen, we need to come to a place where we can know some things. You can know that your father is good. You can know that he wants to heal you, deliver you, provide for you. He, you can know that your father is good to you. You can also know the flow of the spirit of God. That's what the spirit of knowing and seeing over there in, in Corinthian talking about. There is a flow of the spirit of God that you can know. I tell you, I prophesy to you, I declare to you, I, I exhort you that there is a company of the sons of God rising up who will no longer just be, just be ignorant of the flows of the Spirit of God in a service. They will come into a service. They will come into a gathering. They will learn to recognize. They will learn to know. They will learn to flow with the move of the Spirit of God. It's coming. It's upon us. And I want to be in their company. I don't want to be in a service, have God move, and me not know anything, just stare and wonder. No, I want to be, I want to know how the Father's move. Why couldn't I know? I'm his son. Why shouldn't I know? I got the Spirit of God on the inside of me, the same Spirit that's moving in the room. That's why the corporate anointing is necessary. Can I, can I tell you this? That's why it's important that we come to church. Now, again, I recognize that for whatever situation, for whatever reason, sometimes some people can come. That's what we got the online church for. We love you. We want you a part of this. The anointing can flow and touch you right where you are. But for learning purposes, you sometimes got to be in the room to flow with what's happening in the room. Some of you should have gotten more happy about that since you already are in the room. But it's true anyway. And again, I understand there are situations where you cannot get together. In fact, I'm, in fact tomorrow evening, once I'm done preaching here, I got to rush back to my hotel room because I'm, I'm teaching at a Bible school in Asia. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching classes at Rama again in Asia. I, I agreed to do it. And then after I agreed to do it, I realized that there was a time difference and I got to be up at like five in the morning teaching for them. But we're doing it by Zoom. That's all, I understand that because there are situations where you can't all come together. There's nothing wrong with that. There's, there's no condemnation with that. But that, that, that is not going to be the new norm, whatever that means. It's important that believers gather. Why? Because of the corporate flow. If nothing else, because of the corporate flow. And we got we to gotta, we gotta readjust to that. Because if we don't come together this way, the enemy robs us of the corporate flow. 
There is an aspect of the anointing that you cannot, that you and your Bible at, at a coffee shop are not going to get into in a group of believers like you are in here. That's not, that's not church. Well, church is in the building. Church is on the inside of I understand that. But another aspect of that is that the body of Christ, never mind the building, but the body of Christ has to come together. Because that's when the corporate anointing flows, see. Well, I've got the Holy Spirit with me anywhere I can. He, he, he teaches me. Yeah, of course he teaches you. But you've got you to gotta be able to come together and allow for the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher to teach you too. There are some things you can only pick up in, in the room by demonstration. You have to be there. Acts chapter 2 would be an example of that. Jesus had way more than 120 belie- uh, uh, believers in him. Those were the only ones who decided to show up that morning. See what happened when they missed church? (laughs) It could have been 121, it could have been 122, but no, they decided to sleep in that morning. Now, you got to understand that that when when the sons of God come together, and don't get hung up on that sons and say, well, why don't you say daughters? It's just, it's just, that's just, that's just, that's just verbiage, human verbiage to describe the body of Christ. You understand that? We're the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. We're all kinds. Of, it's, it's verbiage. That's all it is. Don't get hung up. Don't get hung up on any of that. There's neither male nor free. There's neither bond nor free. None, none of that exists in the spirit realm. In the spirit, you're spirit. That's it. In the spirit, you're either blood bought or not. That's it. So any term I use that doesn't fit your narrative, that's not what I'm talking about anyway. It doesn't make a difference. Now, back, back, back to Galatians. Now, I say that the heir, as long as he's a, he's a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he's master of all. Oh, listen, here's the tragedy. Here's maybe, a, here's maybe a real sad verse in Scripture. He's a master of all, but lives like a slave, simply because of a lack of maturity. Listen, a lack of maturity will cost you. You not growing in the things of God will cost you. It will cost you an inheritance. And your inheritance too costly for it to cost you that way. Now, if... if, and, and I always say this, if you're new in church, if you've, just, if you've just joined church and you're learning your way, well, praise the Lord, we're glad you're here. Grow. You understand? But on the other hand, if you've been here 40 years and you know as much as you did 40 years ago, maybe it's not so much stroking and encouraging you need, maybe it's more kicking and shouting and screaming that you need. (laughs) Babies are cute unless they're 40-year-old babies. Ba- ba- babies, babies, you know, everyone go goo goo and gaga over them, but no one hands them the keys to anything. Most of the New Testament don't apply to babies because most, most of the New Testament belong to mature sons. And can I, can I, can I, can I tell you this? You, you don't have to be 80 years old to be mature in the things of God. You just have to have a heart to grow in the things of God. Some of you, some of you, some of you missed it. Because when we did the youth revival, you decided not to show because they used that word youth revival and you thought it's just those young people, they got some energy to burn. That's all they need to do is have them come together, jump up and down for 45 minutes, scream and roll around. That's all, that's all what it is. And you thought because it was that, we don't need to show for that. What you moved, what you missed was a move of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> plus, plus, if it was true that you are all that and they are not, why didn't you bring some of your all that so you could help them? So the next time they do that, show up, help us. Three people clapping. We'll try this out of the room. 
No, listen, I am, I'm, 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 I have the privilege, anyone who knows me, who follows me on social media knows it all, that for whatever reason, by the plan of God, because not something I could have cooked up, I have the privilege of getting in rooms with Pentecostal pioneers. They all have served God longer than I've been alive. But I tell you what, my heart in being with them is to receive everything I can for them because there is a generation after them. And if you're not thinking of the generation after you, you're not thinking big enough. They're the purpose for all that you say you want in this lifetime. So I, I, I want to be, I want to be heavily invested in what God is going to do. But in order to be invested in what God's going to do, I got to be invested in what God's doing now. Because if I'm not invested in what God's doing now, I won't know what he's going to do afterwards. And I'm telling you, we've had some great moves of God with those, with those young people. And you all need to, you need to come the next time we do that, if they'll let you come. If they'll let you come, you should. Do you all hear that? I'm telling you, 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 you need to. And let some of that fire get on you. Because maturity hasn't got, maturity in the things of God hasn't got, now experience comes, wisdom comes with age. I understand that. But boy, I tell you what, you could be hungry for God at any one age and God can show up and move in your life and through your life and, 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 and do all kinds of things. I kind of allow, I, I kind of now am, am in that, am, 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 am in that, unusual stage of my life where I have people come to me and say things like, we read your book, and it kind of reminds me of when I was their age and would go up to people and say, I read your book, you know? So it makes me feel a little bit older. And I thought, has it really come down to this? <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just really where we're at now, <laughs> you know? But that's how God intended it to be. God intends that our life be able to reflect onto the next. Why? Listen, listen. This is what the spirit of sonship will do. The spirit of sonship will be about the Father's business. Let's try Galatians one more time. Let's try Galatians. Come on, we've got time tonight, right? Because service tomorrow only started, what, 10? Yeah, there you go. We've got time. Verse 2, but it's under guardians and stewards. Thank God for guardians and stewards in the body of Christ. Listen, if you a child, if you young, if you new in the things of God, the best thing you can do is make sure you've got guardians and stewards in your life. We call them pastors. Did you hear that? Yeah, the best thing you could do if you want to grow, make sure you've got guardians. That's why, come to church. Be a part of church. Because there's guardians and stewards here who can help you, mature you, guard, guard you, and care for you. I got them in my life. I've got people in my life. And I'll tell you this. I'll testify to you and tell you this. About 10 years ago, the Lord spoke to me and told me that I needed to have prophetic voices into my life and not just around my life. And, and when I did, I'll tell you what. A couple of years back when I need the Spirit of God help me, those people saved my life. Amen. Saved my life. They saved my life. They saved my life, saved my ministry, saved everything about me. We need guardians and stewards in the body of Christ. You understand? Look at this now. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. Think about this. Here is a child of God, bondage to the elements of the world. Now, didn't say going to hell. Didn't say bound by the devil, just bound by the world. See, there are benefits to growing up. The benefits to grow, the benefits to growing up. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. We're talking about sonship this whole weekend. Something happened. When the Son, the image of the Son, the Son, the image of the Father is represented on the earth. Something's broken over us by demonstration of the image of the Son. 
But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. And I tell you this, we've been adopted into the family, and therefore, by virtue of that, his, God, Jesus' father has become my father in the same way that God called him our father, I call him our father too. And because you are sons, God has set forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Ooh, listen, listen, listen. In the same way that Jesus had resource to all, of the fa- all that the Father had, you and I have resource to the same Father because we have the same Spirit. And in a way, in a very scriptural way, we are the same Son. We're not the Son, but we are a Son. And because we are a son of the same father, I have access to the same father, and I have access to everything that the father has access to because I have the same spirit. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Romans, let's go back to Romans real quick. Come on, go back to Romans real quick. Ah, you sense the Spirit of God building this in the room. You sense the Spirit of God building this in the room. You know why, I'm, you know why I always pause and say things like that? Because we need to learn to sense how God's moving in the room. Yeah. And sometimes if you don't say these things, people don't learn to sense them, and they just think, well, that's a good inspirational message, or at least I hope you think it's that way. But it's a good inspirational message, and they don't, they don't recognize that the anointing is building something on the inside of you. Yeah. Roman 8, Roman 8. Roman 8, jumping on verse 19. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. Can I tell you? (laughs) Oh my, I remember one time the Lord showed me this. And, And whatever need, whatever challenge is in front of you, you know what it's crying out for? It's crying out for the revealing of you, the Son of God. That, 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 that physical anything that's in front of you, it's waiting for the revealing of the Son of God to come into that and say, Stop! In Jesus' name, shrink up and die. It's, it's that, 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 that financial lag in front of you is waiting for the image of the Son of God to say, be filled and overflow. It's waiting. Everything you could be facing right now is waiting for the image of the Son of God to walk in there and say, this will stop now. Light be. No servant can do that. Because no servant technically dares speak outside of his master. But the son, the son represents the father. The son knows the father. The son is actually a representation and the very likeness of the father. So therefore, the the son can just get up and say, peace, be still. And Jesus didn't didn't have to stop and pray and ask, now God, what do you want me to do with this storm? Didn't have to do that because the son represents the father. Yeah. So, so the expectation of creation. Everything in your life now is a creation. Listen now, listen now. Everything in your life now, the good and the not so good, is a creation. If it's a physical condition, it's a creation. If it's a relationship, it's a creation. If it's a lack, it's a creation. And it's waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. And when the sons of God be revealed, everything balances out to what the Father intended for for it to be. (laughs) Oh, this is good. This is good. Jump on down, jump on down, jump on down. Jump on down. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Notice how he didn't say weakness. He said weaknesses. So we got more than one. You say, well, that's a bad confession. No, that's just a statement of fact because that's not the end of the sentence. Can I tell you, faith people, 
confessing people. You can have what you say, people. Listen. You admitting to God what's not right isn't a bad confession. If that's all you say, that's a bad confession. But if you say, God, here's what's wrong, and here's what I know you can do, and if you will focus on what you know God can do, and you, all you do is simply telling him, Lord, here's where the deficit is, but I know you're able to supply. Here's what you told me to do. I don't have the resources to do that, but because you told me what to do, I know you can supply. If you will go to God with that, that's, that's, that's what God will do for you. So I have no problem going to God and say, God, I got weaknesses in my life. But I know that when I'm weak, you strong. The past couple of years, I've had some moments where I have been the weakest I've ever been. The weakest I've ever been. Felt like some of these situations that happened, felt like both my legs were cut off. A couple of mornings, felt like I didn't want to get out of bed, just would rather curl up there and just never get up ever again. And I had to draw, I had to be able to say, God, I don't know that I have the strength to do this, to even roll out of bed. But I'm thinking you can help me. And I'll take a step towards that. And I'll testify and tell you this, that the past couple of years, I have been the most fruitful I've ever been. When I look back now, I really don't know how it happened because uh, half the time, half, well, I'll, well, I'll tell you one thing I do know. I'll tell you one thing I do know. Uh, one thing I did on purpose was to make sure that I stayed in the flow of the anointing. Yes. That was one thing I did on purpose. That was one of the reasons why I wanted to do the youth camp. I wanted to plant seed. That was, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to do that. I wanted to plant seed. That was one of the reasons why I wanted to do that. You know, I, I put myself... You, listen, you can't always change everything, but you can put yourself in the flow of the anointing, and the anointing can change everything. You, you can't always change people, you can't always change situations, but if you can put yourself in the flow of the anointing, the anointing won't just remove that, won't just protect you, but the anointing has a way of preserving you. And I, I learned that the anointing can preserve me when it looked like death and destruction and no strength and no want to. Oh, no, forget no strength. I didn't even want to have strength. But I stayed in that flow, and that flow preserved me. I was pickled in the anointing. <laughs> yeah, l listen, why shouldn't the anointing be able to preserve you? If the anointing can, can break yoke and destroy all that other, what's the point of all that if it couldn't preserve you? I found that sometimes the best thing I could do was just stay in the flow and allow for that flow to flow over me, around me, in me, through me. And just as I did that, I would have breath for another day. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. Here's our weaknesses. Here's number one. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Here's how lost we are. We don't even know what to pray for. Forget about how to pray. If you don't know what to pray for, you for sure don't know how to pray for it. Here's why we need the Holy Ghost. We don't even know what to pray for. We think we do. But when we think we do, and if that's all we pray about, that's us praying out of the flesh. That's when we, that's when we start praying Ooh, listen, when you pray out of your head, when you pray out of your flesh, that's when you either start praying prayers that are out of your desire. It might be a good desire, but still out of your desire. But when you start praying prayers over God, what to do with other people, what to make them say, what, where to make them go, what to, and all that, you, you, you know what that's called? That's called witchcraft. Father, make them do this. Father, make them say that. Father, make them this. What and you, you're doing all of that, and you're trying to get them to do whatever you think needs to be done, and, 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 and ending it in the name of Jesus, that doesn't make it prayer. Why not say, God, you love them more than I do. Your hand is bigger than mine. You know more than I do. Lord, however you need to work with them, work with them. Because I don't know. I don't know enough. I don't know enough, but I know that you know them more than I do, so we're going to trust them to your hands. 
God, if only they were just, oh Lord, you, 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 you make them stop this, you make them start that, you make them say this, you make, listen, you don't want to be in that position where you suddenly become God. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as, as we ought, but the Spirit Himself. Here's how important you and I are that the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us. Oh, listen, listen, listen. Here's how important our sonship is. Here's how important our inheritance is. Here's how important we recognize that we're heirs is. Here's how important it is that the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us. It's that important. Just like our salvation was so important that the Son of God Himself had to come redeem us, our destiny, our sonship after our salvation is so important that it was the Spirit. It is the Spirit Himself come pray for us and pray us into that. Ooh, you sense that? You sense that when you talk about how important it is that the Spirit, you sense that in the room, the Spirit witnesses your spirit. Verse 27, now he who searches the hearts, so therefore you could say that when he makes intercession for us, he's searching our hearts. There is an aspect of intercession that searches the hearts. Now when he who, now when he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, so the Spirit isn't just a warm, fuzzy feeling of a dove come fly in the room. The Spirit have a mind. If he has a mind, he's got will, emotions, want-tos, don't want-tos. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Why? Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, listen, if intercession can be made according to the will of God, the implication is there's also intercession that can be made not in the will of God. Come on, you all catching up with this? Yes. And we know, this verse 28, this, 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 this everyone's favorite right here. Verse 28. But how many of you know that verse 28 comes after verse 26? Come on, you all knew that, right? See the level of revelation I bring to church every time I come? Here's why people have me come in. And we know that all things, and we know Ooh, listen, he wasn't just believing something, he knew, he knew, he knew, he said, and we know, he didn't say, and we believe, and we pray, and we hope, and we want it, he said, and we know that all things, wait a minute, how did he reach that place of knowing? He reached that place of knowing by yielding to the Holy Ghost, and have the Holy Ghost make intercession for him. When you allow for the Holy Ghost to make intercession for you, you go from believing into knowing. So therefore, a realm of knowing is available to me as a believer. The way I go from believing to knowing is by the vessel and the vehicle of the Holy Ghost making intercession, praying out the wills and plans of God for me. And by doing that, I go from believing, hoping, wanting, and I go into the place of knowing. And we know that all things, so then all things must include things I don't quite like. Because if all things only meant things I like, and there are things I don't, and everyone has things they don't like in their life, right? Sometimes we call those things relatives. Sometimes, it doesn't always have to be that way. Sometimes, I said, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. And, and we know that all things work together for good, so all things has to include the things I like and the things I don't like. We can come to a point of knowing. I want to get there. I want to get to a point of knowing where the things I like and the things I don't like, God's working together, bringing it all together for my good. Now, that, that, that isn't to say that God caused the things. Because really, there's three sources for anything to come. There's God, could be stir something. 
the enemy could be stir something, people could stir something. People could, people, people could stir stuff. And, and you, know how you, you, know how, you know how people say, well, everything happened for a reason? Yeah, most of the time, the reason is people make bad decisions. That's a tweetable moment right there. <laughs> Most of the stuff that happened isn't really God or the devil. It's just people making bad decisions. An untrained, unrenewed mind make bad decisions. And then, and then of course, when people do that, the enemy take advantage of that. You, you, he, he jump in and he'll, because he's an opportunist. He'll take any opportunity you give him. But boy, I want to get to a place where I know that it comes my way and I like it. God's going to work it to my even better good. But if it come my way and don't like it, God, you're still bigger than that situation. And in that, through that, by that, you flip it around so that somehow, some way, some, somewhere, it'll work together for my good still. Amen. But I reach this place of knowing, I reach this place of knowing by learning to yield to the Spirit of God in prayer so that He can make intercession for me. So that's why the Spirit of God needs to make intercession for us as sons because in doing that, we can know that our Father is bigger than anything and anyone and anywhere and any time and any what that's right in front of us. It doesn't matter how big and bad it looks. God's able to turn that for my good. Now, turn that for my good doesn't mean that, that He removed that. Doesn't, mean he, he, doesn't even mean He changed that. It might just be what it is. But somehow, somewhere, from that, good can come to me. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Well, am I one of those that love God? If you're asking, you're at least at a point of wanting to love God. So then you don't have to, you don't have to wonder then. You don't have to wonder. And who are called according to his purpose. Well, what's his purpose? I don't know that I'm ever going to be a missionary. I don't know that I'm ever going to preach. Listen, here's what his purpose is. Next verse. Next verse. For whom he foreknew, which is you. How did he foreknow you? Because before the foundation of the earth, before the foundation of the earth, the lamb was slain for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believed believe on him will have life. You see, God gave his son before you were here to, before you were here to need his son, he gave his son for you. So this is, this is me he's talking about. This is me he's talking about. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Listen, this is my one purpose in life. This is our one, we have nothing, no other call. Well, I thought my call was to go be a missionary somewhere to preach, to raise lots of money and give to the kingdom. No, 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 no. All of that is a result of what I'm called to do. Here's what I'm called to do. I only have, we only have the one call in life. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. Everything on the earth realm today, it is calling out for the image of the Son. And you're it. I'm it. We're it. I tell you what, the sons of God are arising on the earth. There are mature ones rising forth all across the earth where they are representing the image of the sun. And because they represent the image of the sun, they are able to prophetically declare the will of the Father into those situations. Verse, verse, verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, and of course, this is a rhetorical question. The answer is yes, he is, if you're wondering. Of course, God is for his son. Aren't you always for your kids, no matter how bad they mess up? That's why his mercies are new every morning. Now, I would like to live in a place, I would like to live in a place where I don't continually mess up, but when I do, my father made, made provision of mercy for me even before I did. My, my trust is in his mercies made available for me because I can fall onto that and it'll bounce me right back up again. What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? A 
as the image of the sun. Oh, listen, as the image of the sun, nothing can be against you and stand in your way. Because you're the image of the sun. You carry the word of the Father. You carry the anointing, the call, the purpose. You carry the person of the Father in your image of the sun. You are his very likeness in that situation. And I'll tell you what, where light is, there cannot be darkness. Ah, oh, my, my, my. My, 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 my. Verse 26, uh, verse, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Rhetorical question. The answer is nothing. Why? Because when, I'm, when, you, when you recognize that you're in the image of the Son, your Father is always going to be your Father. Now, you can walk away from your Father. You, can, you, ever seen, you ever seen kids, they throw a fit, they tell their mom and dad, we hate you? No, no one in here, okay, fine. There are other kids outside of this church who say that sometimes. But did you know that them saying that doesn't disqualify the fact that they still are their Father's Son? Now, while they're in that state of rebellion against the Father, they may not have access to most of the Father's goods for them. But it doesn't change relationship. And while they're in the state of rebellion, all kinds of stuff could happen that the Father doesn't want for them. But it doesn't, doesn't change relationship, though. Verse 37. Verse 37, it's almost the end of the chapter, but it's not almost all that God wants to do in the service yet. You sense this strong anointing come in the room tonight, teaching us and, and lifting us up that way. You understand? We've got to learn to give in to these anointings. We've got to learn to give in to these anointings, you see. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. What are the things that we conquer over? Anything that is against our sonship. Ooh, listen, anything that challenges your sonship, anything that challenges your sonship, anything that challenges your sonship, you can conquer that. <sighs> Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. To him who loved us. I, I, love, I, love, the, I love how this says that the way we conquer things. It's by Him loving us. Don't, don't you love that? Amen. Through Him who loves us, not by us loving Him, but Him loving us. I, I, I love that, that the way I conquer anything is by Him loving me. Look at this now. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us, for I am persuaded. Did you know that being persuaded is the same as, as knowing something? If you're persuaded, you know something. Oh, listen. Sons know. Servants guess. Remember that. Anytime you don't know anything about your father, you're operating from the servant mind, not the son mind. And God want to elevate us tonight, bring us to a place where, where, where we operate from sonship, not servanthood. Again, in serving God, we serve as servants. I understand that. But boy, I tell you what, you better know that your relationship with Him is not master-servant. Your, your relationship is Abba, Father, and my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principality, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor... Listen, he's listing everything that he could possibly think of. You, you can throw in, your, your, you can throw in your, your little mess in here too. Nor things that, that are created, nor any created thing. Remember how we talk about created things, waiting for the, for the image of the Son of God? Nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ. Oh, listen, listen, listen. Go on back to verse 14. Go on back to verse 14. Go on back to verse 14. You, you all allowing this to teach you? Verse 14, verse 14. We'll, we'll camp here for a little bit. 
We'll talk about this for a little bit. For as many as... Now, like I said, the journey between slave and son is the leading of the Holy Ghost. Did did you hear that? The, the, The difference between the slave and the son is the leading of the Spirit of God. So the slave acts on a word, but the son instinctively knows what the father wants anyway. So the slave has to say, God, what do you want? What should I do in this? And again, there's nothing wrong with that, but there is a higher place, whereas the son, I know what my father wants. And I I can get to the place where I know what my father wants and because I am the representation of the father as the image of the son, I can just get up and act and flow. Listen now, verse 14, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the mature ones, the mature sons of God. God is in the business today. God is in the business now of maturing the sons of God. And now more than ever before, listen, some of you in here, God might have told you to start a business and you're like, well, I don't know. I don't know if I can. Listen, if you will give in to that, if you will give in to that leading, you will find that God didn't just want to nudge you to give out of nothing. By the time he nudged you, he already had provision planned for you. God, I don't know that, well, God's leading you, nudging you to do something. By the time he nudged you and leads you to do any one thing, All he needs to do is for you to give in to that, and you will find that as you give in to that, all provision, all favor, all wisdom, all peoples are already in place waiting for you. Ah, the things of the Spirit of God belong to me as I am led by Him, as I learn to be led by Him. That's how Jesus knew how to do all the things that He knew how to do, was because He was nudged by the Spirit of God. And if the son can be that way, I, as a son, can move up to that also. Ah, oh, it's time. I tell you, it's time. It's time for the rising of the mature sons of God. It's time for the body to rise up and to think where we move as how we are led, not just because an opportunity comes, not just because a command comes, not just any of that, but we move by how the Spirit of God lead us and how the Spirit of God guide us. It's, it's time for the mature sons to arise, and the only way that ever arises is when we recognize that God intends to lead us from being a slave to being a son I intend to walk into my sonship I, I've, 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 had situ- I've had situations where God would nudge me and lead me to serve someone do something, give something respond some way somehow and I, in my mind I thought no they don't need me they don't want me, I don't want me you know, I don't know, I don't even know that I could do that. But I knew that if I would give in to the nudge, more important than the reward of what would come from obeying that nudging. Listen, here's what's more important. More important than what would come from obeying that nudging would be the fact that I would grow deeper in my sonship. And in growing into my sonship, I move from child to heir. And when I move from child to heir, ooh, I inherit everything. Be led of the Holy Ghost. Allow for the anointing within you to stir you. Allow for the anointing within you to move you. Allow for the anointing within you to, to, to hold you back or push you forward. That's how life is supposed to be lived as a believer. I like talking about my sonship because me talking about my sonship magnifies the fatherhood of God. For me to be a son would make him a father. For him to be my father would mean that he would supply everything I need because that's what fathers do. They, by virtue of being a father, know. You see, the issue we're talking about here is relationship. It's what we're talking about. We're not just talking about function. We're talking about relationship. 
Ah, oh, listen, more than anything else, I want relationship with God. More than anything else, I want to be able to move with my Father. More than anything else, I want to be able to reflect the image that He intended for me, preordained for me, predestined for me to be, because that's what He ordained for me. That's what His plan was for me from the very get-go, was that I would be like the image of the Son. The image itself, which means that in every good thing, I represent the Son. Which would mean that in any room, in any situations that is dark, I get to go in and say, light be. I don't have to, I don't have to say, ooh, the, the dark's coming. Let's move up. Ooh, the dark's, the, it, the dark's growing darker. It's growing in influence. Ooh, let's run away. No, listen, I get, to, I get to go up to the dark and say, dark, stop, light be. But you see, the servant don't get to do that. The child don't get to do that. The mature sons do. There are benefits to maturing in the things of God. Sonship, sonship. Ah, mambre feleso ka. I hear, I hear sonship. I hear the spirit of adoption come in the room. I hear the father stirring hearts and say, "Come to the father." My, 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 Vrem Ben Jengala Bafrinasa Koriande, Zambra Folusanaya. Look at this, look at this. Almost done, almost done. Almost done in the preaching part, at least. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you did not receive, again, the bondage of uh, the spirit of bondage to fear. You see, the servant, the servant continually walks about with fear that they'll disappoint the Father. Because it isn't their father, it's their master. I got to do good so the master will be pleased with me. I, 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 I got to measure up to what, to, what, to, what, to what the master intends for me. But did, you know, but did you know that the son, because they already are in the image of the father, the father and the son are one? And the son understands that if the son doesn't measure up, the father's love, grace, and mercy will rise him up so he can measure up. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. I don't know that there is a more powerful phrase in Scripture than to be able for us to say, Abba, Father. I don't, I, that, at this point, for, for what we're talking about today, I'll tell you what, this is, this is potentially the most powerful verse in here that we get to call God. That we get to call, ooh, listen, to everyone else, he may be judge, to everyone else, he may be king, to everyone else, he may be creator, to everyone else, he may be everything else, but to you and I, he's Abba, Father. And only sons know that. Only sons know that. You ever been, you ever been, you ever been somewhere, I have been, where some little kid think you're his dad and come running up to you? They, they didn't know. You, you, you ever had that happen? Huh? Some little kid come up, hold your hand, some little kid come up, hug your leg, something, you know? I've been at a theme park, some little kid come up, I'm like, I'm pretty sure you're not mine. <laughs> at least no one told me anything about it. I mean, no one told me anything about it. Like, what? I'm not paying for you. Pretty sure no one said anything to me. No, but the mature sons, they know. Sonship is the purpose of Jesus coming to the earth. Sonship is the purpose of God putting you on the earth because God needed his image represented to take back and redeem and reclaim everything that the enemy had tried to stole out of the earth realm. That's why he had to come to the earth, from the earth, in the earth, create an image of him so that the light would come and shine out the darkness. This is your purpose. You haven't got anything else. Everything else you want to do comes from your purpose. But your purpose is to be the image of the sun on the earth. 
And I'll tell you this, we got to have us, a group of people rise up who are willing to go into every, every place in society and say, I will represent the sun in this. In that business, I will represent the sun. In that relationship, I will represent the sun. In that family, I will represent the sun. In that hospital room, I will represent the sun. In that, in that dark place, I will represent the The sons of God are rising up. The mature ones are rising up. I declare over you, there is coming new sensitivities to the leading of the Holy Ghost. You will be led, you will be more sensitive to the leading that you've ever been. I say that over you. 2022, that's the year that's coming up. I say over you, you will be more tender to the nudgings. You will be more moved by, you will be easier to be moved by the things of the Spirit of God. Because that's how we move from slave to child, to son. Oh, my, 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 my. The leading of the Spirit of God is everything. Because in the leading of the Spirit of God, you find who you are. In the leading of the Spirit of God, you find your image. Ha ha, I sense a spirit of adoption come in the room. What does that mean? That means that means that the Father come to remind us of whose we are. You see, you don't know who you are until you know whose you are. If you know whose you are, you will automatically know who you are because who you are is based on whose you are. 